Welcome to worship this morning. Certainly, certainly we need a better day. So I pray that uh, we are looking forward to that. Uh, thank you to those of you who are joining us to worship uh, virtually, to those of you who are visiting, certainly to those of you who are members and of the body of Christ here at Bridgepoint Church. We thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today, we will be uh, engaging, as is our custom, uh, with a message that will follow up with a communion. So if uh, you are visiting with us for the first time, and, uh, and then sometimes, you know, we have those of us who are there a lot, and uh, sometimes we still forget. So I want to remind you right now to gather your materials for communion. It's very simple, very easy to do. Uh, just grab cracker, juice, bread, or wine so that we can partake in the Lord's Supper together. Amen. And uh, so what I'll do right about now is I'll go ahead and pray as we get into today's message. Let's go to God. Father, thank you so much for a day, a day and an opportunity by which you make your mercies brand new. We are so grateful. We are undeserving of your grace. But as it is, that you give us a chance and an opportunity at life. Help us to make the most of it today. I pray that what we do and how we engage in your word, how we interact with it, that uh, it permeates our hearts. Father, that it, it strengthens us and it quickens us to the holy and righteous action to which you will be pleased with. Father, there is a world out there in which we live and we exist Father, and we are to be your ambassadors to help make a difference, God, for this world. God, we thank you so much for the privilege of engaging in your holy text. It is in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. So right now we are in week two of our Moving On series. Last week we talked about, or the title was Ready to Move On. So if we're going to be moving on, first of all, we have to determine whether or not we are ready to move on. I'm just saying, with the events of last week, I think a lot of us are ready to move on. In fact, last week when the, the, at the title of the message had an, uh, a question mark or an exclamation mark. I believe that this week we are probably ready to move on with an exclamation mark. And hopefully we anticipate that with a lot of great energy and a lot of verb that we put into it. Uh, I'm grateful for the Bible. Uh, this is a reprieve for us to be able to gather together in worship. I know that personally, I would always look forward to Sundays, getting together, seeing the brothers and sisters in the faith and being in an environment uh, by which I can feel the encouragement uh, from the brothers and sisters. And again, while we are virtual, uh, I thank you so much uh, for your prayers. They are working. And uh, I know that we are praying for one another. So we get to feel the energy of God because he's not bound by time or space or distance. So thank you to those of you who are continuing to pray. I'd like to go ahead now and direct our attention to Luke chapter 3. This is the chapter uh, that we will be focusing on. It was the, the chapter that we were in last week, and we will just be looking at some of the subsequent verses from where we left off. Um, God's Word is just powerful. I'm so excited to read this. Okay, let's go ahead and go. Verse 7. The title of today's message is uh, mo uh, moving Beyond Myself. That's the title for today's message. It's Moving Beyond Myself. What we're going to be talking about is really how when we move on with God, when we move on in his favor, we have to move beyond ourselves. And really, we will discover some of the gems, if you will, the spiritual gems that exist when we do move beyond and we move past ourselves. In verse 7, I love this right here. We are, again, with John the Baptist, and he's preaching to the crowds and says that John said to the crowds, coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? 
produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I don't know about you, but you could be wondering if people are coming out to get baptized. Obviously, they've heard about John's teachings. They're impacted by it. The hearts of people are moving everywhere. So people are coming out to see John, to hear the message, and to not only hear the message, but they're coming to get baptized. And so as they're coming down, John is like, you brood of vipers. Like, man, John the Baptist is crazy. Why is he so abrasive? I, I'm just saying, we're a lot softer today than people were back in the day. We're, we're just a lot more sensitive than people were. So, but nevertheless, those are pretty, but let's look at it in context. I'd like to show you something else. Matthew chapter 3. You all can put that slide up. Because there are two accounts of this particular event that occurred while John the Baptist was preaching. So if you look at Matthew chapter 3 in the same account that Luke is sharing, he says this, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. And then it goes on with the rest of the scriptures. So Everybody can kind of pipe down. You can relax. He wasn't going off on the people who were impacted by the message. However, John had a point of exclamation for those who were religious. He had a point of exclamation to those who only uh, laid account to them simply having an affiliation with a synagogue, an affiliation with the temple, much like people today who just simply and religiously go to church but don't really have anything in mind for the community and for the society in which they live in. They don't speak to it. They don't address anything good. So he wasn't out of his mind. You know, it's, it's pretty interesting. I got, a, I got a picture up here. You know, uh, John wasn't completely out of his mind. You know, although he did... Uh, you know, partake in locusts and wild honey, and he had an outfit with camel's hair. You know, I don't know, maybe John was a fashion trendsetter. We don't, we don't quite know. I don't know if he looked like that guy that you're seeing up there. But one of the, well, one of the things that's really impressive about John the Baptist is that his message and the way that he delivered it was consistent with the way that Jesus preached. And in fact, he began his ministry before Jesus began his ministry. He challenged the religious. He challenged the people who were of public influence, but they did not uphold the good of the people. That was John the Baptist. He challenged the people who only had interests for themselves and they only had interest for others who were like them, but not the interest for the good of a community. He challenged those who had the elite status of political power. He challenged those who had the influence and the social status, but didn't use that, pop, that influence and that status for the good of the greater community that God was desiring to build. I love it because Jesus would continue to endorse and affirm these words by John the Baptist. And I believe that Jesus really looked at the incredible work that John the Baptist did. He looked at the power and the zeal and the fervor that he preached, that his strength in doing so, his outspokenness, but his outspokenness wasn't out of ignorance and his outspokenness wasn't irresponsible. In fact, it was exceptionally 
responsible. And so at one point, Jesus says this about John the Baptist. He says, what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see a prophet? When you got there, you saw more than a prophet. In fact, among those born from women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. This is the person that you went out to see. This is the preaching to which you have heard, the preaching of impact. So indeed, what makes Jesus and God so proud of John the Baptist is certainly his fortitude. It is his gumption to not only tell what will take place in the future, because that's what prophets did. You know, they would, they would give a word for what would happen in the future. However, prophets also gave word and testimony to what was directly present and relevant in the community, directly relevant and present with what was going on in their society. He loved it because he had the boldness to be inspired by God and to do it unabashedly for people. When he spoke truths, he did it because others were either too afraid to speak the truth, because we have those like that, too afraid to speak the truth, and then we have those who are just simply uninspired to speak the truth. Of course, last week was filled with a ton, ton of events. And what, what other place would you expect to hear the truth other than in the house of God? Jesus says that I am the way, I am the truth and the life. So how, how can you live and move and exist with God without addressing truths? Church is not the, not the place where we run away from truth. It is the place where we face truth and we take them and apply them to the, word of, to the Word of God and then re-deliver it in love to a dying world. You know, when I think about truth or not addressing truth, I think about elephants. You know, we always have that saying, very familiar saying, oh, there's an elephant in the room. You know, I've been known to be the person to, I, I can't allow an elephant to be in my room. I, I, just, I cannot do it. If, if everybody else's head is down, I'm going to point the elephant out. I'm going to say something about it. And the reason that I do it is because that is the exact example that Jesus, it's what he showed, it is what he demonstrated. He addressed elephants. John the Baptist address elephants. What are the elephants that exist today? What are the elephants that exist right now that make people a little edgy and they don't want to say anything about it? I want you to consider this. This is what I'm, I'm calling elephantology, okay? This is, this, is Brown, this is Brown's week, okay? This is, you know, this, this is my word. This comes from the Brown Dictionary, elephantology. However, this is something that you can find out and research on your own. It'll be very easy, and I'm sure some of you guys will Google it on the side. But when elephants are young, and when they are young, if, if they're not a part of a pack, and those elephants are ignored. If the elephants grow up unguided, then the elephants, they grow up to be bullies. The elephants grow up and they grow up, they, they are out of control. And what they do when they grow up and they're out of control because they weren't really guided, they weren't really with a, with a pack, they wreak havoc on people. They wreak havoc on buildings. They destroy them. Sounds a little bit familiar, huh? In order to move on with the purpose that God has for us to fulfill and the commission that Christ has commanded, let us right now, because we are in the house of truth, even though you're virtual, we're engaged together spiritually, we are in the house of truth. So let's avoid code and address the elephants that are in our rooms, in our society 
today. These are the things that John the Baptist would certainly address if he was here. And I'll, be, I, I'll begin. It, it'll be a little ramp up. All right. So when there's a high familiarity, when you're highly familiar with people, there's a considerable level of trust that you extend to people that are like you. And you are quick and apt to assume best intent. To take it further, if you want to protest or if you want to demonstrate, if you are of this particular race, or if you look like X, Y, Z, then it's okay. There's no need for tanks, no need for tear gas. That's, that's not even necessary. In, in fact, just out of the sake of formality, what we'll do is we'll just stand post and keep a lookout, just for formality. Now we get to the real elephant. Here's the real elephant that white privilege actually exists. It, can no, it is no longer hidden. This is one of the things that God, God has continued to show this and to reveal it over and over again. It exists. It is the very reason that what we saw this past week, that people would be allowed permission to go and stand in areas that were vehemently prohibited for black and brown people to go and stand without escort. And here's what, the, here's what the power of privilege, what it actually does. And I, I'm sure that right for some reason, some people may be squirming in their seats for something that exists today, something that is inevitable. But let me tell you the, the power of the white privilege, that even to the people who are oppressed by it, the people who are even oppressed by this privilege will go the full way of even denying that it exists. And in fact, not only denying, you may even combat those who bring up the phrase. You're ready to make your phone calls. I can't believe he said this. The truth of it is that when people do that, particularly to those who are oppressed, what you're trying to accomplish <laughs> is what you feel like is a safe space. You're trying to create and maintain your own safe space so that you can feel comfortable. And as a result, what happens is there's a false sense and a facade of harmony at the absolute best because there is no harmony. Next elephant is the glaring truth of systematic, systemic racism. It does exist. What I want to say about this is thankfully, there are many of those who are in the, in the white and Caucasian community who are growing and having, growing with the humility of actually addressing it. And we thank you for your hearts in doing so. There are those in, this, in that same community who are not only admitting the truth, but they are breaking the silence that perpetuates the violence against black and brown people and making strides against taking appropriate action against the deeds of, misjust, of injustice. Here's another elephant that we witnessed this week. And it was once again a full display on the stage because everybody's talking about it, is that law enforcement actually knows how to demonstrate restraint when they want to. In fact, when they feel that their lives are in imminent danger, they know how to run away with their weapons against the people who do have weapons. Talking about the elephants. But that only works if you look the part. Another thing we saw, and it will be a warning, I believe that John the Baptist will say is that is, beware of the gamble and the risk of placing your trust into leadership 
of which you have had to continually overwork yourself to clean up and ultimately sear your conscience to justify their actions. And this is irregardless of any political party or affiliation. This is just, this is a leadership and followership 101 to beware of those things. These are the things that he would address. And to double down on the notion, he would, he would speak these things to the disciples and the religious. And just as what he was said was uncomfortable for many back in the day when he was calling them a brood of vipers, guess what? It will still be uncomfortable today to hear it. But the way, but the way to get to God is not through comfort. Our hearts being impacted by God is, is not comfortable. It involves hearing messages and challenges that are uncomfortable, but yet true. Here's something. Just because something is uncomfortable, when you address it, doesn't make it irresponsible when you speak on it. People sometimes feel like, oh, that's too uncomfortable to address. So then if you speak on it, they make it... They make you seem like you're being irresponsible. But just because something is uncomfortable doesn't make it irresponsible when you speak truth to it. So now that we got the, so, so in order to move on in our lives, we always have to get the elephants out the way. We can never move on in lives. We can never be worshipers of spirit and truth the way Jesus calls us to be if we don't address the elephants. So now that we've got the elephants, we've addressed those things. These are the things that God calls us to, regardless of our race, regardless of our socioeconomic status, regardless of our gender. These are sound doctrines that we can find from the scriptures. So let's move on into verse 10. I love this right here. So John addresses the elephants he, he puts the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees on blast. And so then he attends to the people. Verse 10, the people who are coming out to get baptized say, what shall we do then? That's says the crowd asked. And then John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Next two verses, even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, what shall we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him. There's all kinds of people coming out to get baptized, all kinds of people moved by the word of God. The soldiers asked him, and what shall we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Don't be content with your pay. Don't accuse people falsely and be content with your pay. I love it because once again, we see the powerful preaching of the word of God, the preaching of truth and not the preaching of opinions. This is what drives people to not only inquire about God, but to make a commitment to change their lives. I also love this because in, in these verses here, we see John really transitioning from addressing a crowd, from a, a blanket message, if you will, to addressing the direct spiritual needs of people. This is a great example of what a ministry look, looks like. You know, there are things that we have to incorporate, and God expects for us to incorporate on a broad scale level, on a wide level, on a corporate level. However, what a good ministry looks like is being able to meet the individual needs of people with where they are. A good ministry is not a one size fits all because every situation is different. One size does not fit all hearts. So ultimately, these people who were coming to John the Baptist and they were asking him the question, the crowds, the tax collectors, the soldiers, these were people who were ready to move on beyond themselves. 
And the beautiful thing about it is that when you look at the challenges that John the Baptist gave, every challenge had to do with something that involved them with their contact with other people. It was moving them beyond themselves. He was calling them out of the place of selfishness. I'm just saying, sometimes, as the, I mean, we're all people and we all got our things, but doggone it, sometimes, disciples, we can be so selfish. It's just me, 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 me. I want, I want, I want, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this. I want that. But how often do you spend your time praying for other people, laboring for other people in prayer? You know, in verses 10 and 11, he, you know, here's a challenge because John wasn't afraid to address the hearts when they were open. Sometimes when people bring, when God brings people to us and their hearts are open, man, we're, we're, we, we like to tiptoe around issues. We don't want to say, uh, we don't want to run them off. Man, listen, if God is enabling people, because God says that, Jesus says that the Father enables the hearts of those who are seeking him. So in verses 10 and 11, when he addressed the clouds, he says, hey, go share your clothing. Y'all got plenty of clothes. Look, take, take, take off your polo shirts and give it to somebody else who don't have it. Go give it to Stacy Brown. He don't have no polos. He don't have no azots. Take off your shirt with the alligator on it and give it to somebody who needs it. Go buy yourself a shirt with some camel hair on it like I'm wearing. Share your food. Share your fries. Share your wings. Share your nuggets. Don't double dip. <laughs> Verses 12 and 13 to the tax collectors. He says, treat people honestly with their money. Stop scamming people. Stop frauding people. I don't know about you, but I know I fell victim in 2020 to that Susu scheme. That Susu scam. But the Lord taught me better. The Lord taught me, look, put your money where it really counts. Put it with me. I'm just saying, I'm just wondering how many people put in $100, $200, $500, and then give hardly no money to the house of God. Uh, that's another message right there. I wasn't planning on saying that. That was what the Holy Spirit says. But treating people honestly with their money. Verse 14, when he addresses the soldiers, he says, stop abusing the law. Stop manipulating the law, making it, making it what you want to, padding your salary with corrupt money just so that you can get ahead, writing fake tickets just so that you can get bonuses and move up in the ranks. He addresses the spiritual needs, the direct needs of what people need. The challenge for all of these individuals that in their desire to move on spiritually, they had to repent of their immediate wrongdoings. Now, this doesn't mean that those are the only things that they had to repent of. Because when, when we live this life for God, this is, you know, we know what Jesus says. Hey, deny yourself and take up your cross daily. This is a daily thing. The Bible says that, you know what, when you do this thing with God, God will sanctify you through and through. So the sanctification just doesn't happen one time. It's not a one-off thing. What are your immediate things that you need to repent of right now? Regardless of where you are in the faith, you could be two months in the faith, two weeks in the faith, or 25 years in the faith. What are the things that God is calling you to repent of? Is there someone who's been pointing those things out in your life? Do you even allow people to tell you? I'm just saying nowadays, you know, we have some real funny disciples. They don't want you to tell them nothing. How in the world are you going to grow in God? That's not congruent with the Scriptures. I'm just saying, but you can keep trying that thing by yourself if you want to. You find yourself in the corner trying to figure it out how to love. All right. But who might those people be? 
The beauty of you moving on beyond yourself involves something very beautiful. And that beautiful thing is something that's called restoration. Man, I love restoration. I, uh, a lot of people, they get addicted to the flipping houses because it's all about restoration. We look at people turning old, beat-up cars into something immaculate and beautiful because it's something powerful about restoration, seeing something that's broken down and towed up and that's been through the ringer. And then it comes out better than it was in the beginning. I got to believe that even just with that statement alone, that somebody out there is looking for a restoration. That you're looking to be better than the first day when you started this thing. I like to think of this when John gave the challenges, you know, to the crowds. He gave the challenges to the soldiers. He gave the challenges to the tax collector. Now, those are changes for them, but I want you to think about the flip side of those challenges. Because those challenges involved with how they were to do and treat other people, guess what happened? Other people got restored as a result of their repentance. Think about the people who were being hounded with money, no longer being hounded. The people who were scammed, them getting monies returned back to them. Just like when we saw Zacchaeus in the tree when he saw Jesus, he said, look, I'll get back four times what I've taken from people. Imagine the people who got the return from his repentance. It is the power of moving beyond ourselves. It brings restoration, not only to us, but the Bible says that repentance brings times of refreshing. You know, one of the things I was really encouraged by uh, with Bridge Point Church, and I just wanna give a shout out to everybody, to every heart that, that part, uh, that part uh, take, partook. How do I say that? I, I'd stopped teaching a long time ago. I, for, I forgot my verb tenses, you all. But for everyone who took part, there we go. For everyone who took part in things that we did during, our, during the holidays, because some of those things were first the many homes and the many families that were blessed during the Thanksgiving holidays. It's usually, you know, uh, while we meet here personally, we'll have a, a great meal together right here on site. It, it'll be like a big friends and family day. And man, we're feeding ourselves, we're stuffing our faces, and we're just having a good time. But God moved on the heart of some brothers and sisters and said, now let's take the food outward and let's give and give more and give more. To God be the glory. I think about Angel Tree and how many families were blessed. And although we weren't able to really fully participate in that this year, those who did participate with the Salvation Army. But what it did was, uh, because we are virtual now, it put a mark in our minds to say, hey, you know what? Let's make sure that we're prepared to really engage with the Angel Tree and really give to these needy families during the time. Now, I want to address the hearts of people that were reached during John's preaching. You know, they were impacted by the theme focused on restoration. You know, as God has given you the, the, you know, just the opportunities of mercies being brand new every day, who are you helping to restore? Are you... Is, is there repentance so powerful in your life that it's blessing people and restoring others? One of the things I realized about restoration from repentance, when we move on beyond ourselves, I mean, it, restoration and the benefit of restoration can come from likely and unlikely places. It can come from good and bad situations. Restoration and the benefits of restoration can even come from your enemies and opponents. The power of God is that whoever your assumed enemies are, including socially or even politically, the opportunity for restoration and healing is possible. 
I want you to think about that. Your enemies, socially and politically, restoration is possible. How in the world is it that I can just stand up here and make a bold statement like that? Well, it's not because I'm anybody special. I'm just somebody who reads the Bible, and I'm just foolish enough to believe it. <laughs> because the Bible says that nothing, y'all sit with me while you're at home, nothing is too hard for God. I heard you out there. I know you don't believe me. I, I heard you. And then again, he says that with him that all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Is there somebody out there who's longing for restoration? What is that restoration? Have you prayed for it? Does your heart long for it? During 2020, I know that there have been some desires and some hopes that may have been dashed. But I want to let you know this morning that you don't have to fret. God has your back. He wants to restore you. He sees your tears. He understands what you're going through. He knows your heart. Even though you're all jacked up, even in your selfishness, God still hears you. And the reason he hears you and responds is because he wants you to repent. That's where the blessing comes from. Some of us, we're feeling like 2021 is a fall. Like, oh, man, man, we, we're in the new year. I don't, I don't really see no difference. I'm not experiencing anything differently yet. Guess what? Maybe you're not supposed to. But before you know it, you'll look up in the end of this year. We'll find that you are built up the end of this year, you can find yourself glorified. The end of this year, you can find yourself more fulfilled than what this year looks like right now as it's beginning. God even cares about the little things that, bring, that brings joy to your heart. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God cares about the little things, the little things that bring joy to your heart? That is restoration when he brings those joy when he brings that joy. You know, I want to share a little story. My wife's father left some very particular and very fond, memorable impressions on her. One primary aspect of his life was him being an outstanding musician. And although he did not record commercially, he was known and often performed in the same music circles of the Detroit Motown musicians, vocalists, singers, and even crossed paths with some good old folks, even like Anita Baker before she made her way and break into the industry. After graduation, he would move himself to Atlanta and study as a music major at Morehouse College. And growing up, continuing to grow up, Robin she would recall the very likely and rare truth of thinking to herself, I bet nobody else in Atlanta has a harp sitting in the middle of their living room like I do. As she would continue to grow in age and grow in opportunities, you know, he would invite her to listen to him play at some of the night spots in Atlanta. And at the age of 20, she would encounter the heart-shattering and sudden death of her father just to at least a couple of days after not attending one of the gigs that he asked her to attend. And one of the things that he left behind was a keyboard. This keyboard was his pride and joy. It was a kind of instrument and keyboard that professional players owned and others coveted at that time. It was the Korg M1. And unfortunately, at his passing, she was refused the opportunity to acquire it due to a family member who projected some family discord towards her and ultimately kept the instrument. And at a certain point, that keyboard would be passed on to the daughter of that person. The daughter, who was also Robin's first cousin, would then allow her son to use it for his piano practices for a few years. And then after, several, uh, after eventual disinterest, 
of p- piano playing for the son, it would then be passed over to the sister <laughs> of that first cousin for several years, who was a music major at one of the universities in South Georgia. So what is the testimony behind it? The testimony is, and the, the testimony is the power of restoration, because yesterday, after nearly 29 years, one day before her birthday, which is today, Robin would take a drive full of tears and full of joy to go pick up the keyboard from her cousin who made an inquiry and a request to see if she wanted it because she no longer had room at her own house to keep it. God restored it to her. God restored something that was precious, something that her heart longed for. Something as simple as an instrument. And my wife doesn't even play the keyboard. But it was something that she wanted because it was something left behind by her father. And I can imagine that it was probably one of the best birthday gifts that she could receive. And even though, and I'm just going to say this because my my wife is here with me this morning, even though COVID prevents us with the opportunity to celebrate in a customary uh, brown mega celebration, because that's how we do it. Uh, Happy birthday to you, and I will celebrate your life the best way possible. I am grateful, and I'm continually inspired to see how God continues to bless you. You are truly God's baby, as you are mine. And I doubt that there's any material gift that can really be purchased that would rival that keyboard, but that's the kind of father we have, and that is the kind of God we serve. So I'd like for us to lay aside the idea of something being taken as a result of, because sometimes when things are taken from us, it's because we're irresponsible. Sometimes when things are taken, it's because we mismanage it, or sometimes it's as a result of our misbehavior. But I believe that there is something that God wants to restore to you this morning, something that is rightfully yours, but somehow has been intentionally was held by someone else or perhaps some entity. God's goal is to set you up for fruit in your life, and he's looking for the fruit in your life. He wants it. The byproduct of goodness and healthy growth is fruit. Fruit is the spiritual character, and it is the physical manifestation of also bringing others fully to the body of Christ. How is your personal fruit? When is the last time you've experienced it? Have you ever experienced it? Have you prayed for it? God will make it happen for you if you want to. Know that it takes spiritual investment and an effort on your part, but this is the work of God, and the work of God is worth the work. And just as a tree... As John alluded to earlier, as a tree is expected to yield fruit by season, bearing fruit for God is not a one-time occurrence. This is not a, I'll bear fruit for a while or I'll try for a while and then I'll stop. A, A fruit is expected to bear, a tree is expected to bear fruit each season. You're coming back again and again and you're looking for it. You're looking for that growth. Are you ready for the restoration? It could be as simple as you restoring your focus because you found yourself distracted, so distracted that negativity and toxic situations and conditions prevent you from seeing and taking in the blessings and the positive strides actually happening in your life. There's so, sometimes there are so many great things that are going on and we miss it because of the negativity. I was talking to a brother the other day, and he was, he was pre- prevent, presenting to me some struggles. And he asked for me to pray for him about some things. But then he started to share about the different strides or the different decisions that he was making in his life that was giving forward progress to his situation. And it was so encouraging. I just had to stop him and say, hey, man, look, 
I'm going to pray for all of those different things. But do you understand the restoration that God is bringing to your life as a result of these decisions that you are making? You're doing better than you think. Only the devil wants you to feel like you ain't going nowhere. Only the devil wants you to feel like you're hitting a glass ceiling and there's no reason to try anymore. There's no reason to pray anymore. What it is, it is. It's going to be what it's going to be. That's what, that's what Satan wants you to believe. But God, is, but God is like, no, you keep going. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. One of my favorite uh, scriptures again, when, uh, when, Judd, when they say, hey, Jesus, Herod wants to get rid of you. He says, go tell that fox. I'll drive out demons today and tomorrow and on the third day, I will reach my goal. This is the message of moving beyond ourselves, moving into restoration. God wants to get something back to which your heart has been longing for. I'd like to share another scripture with you. It's one of, one of the ones that's carried me over the past couple of years. And this is in Hebrews 6.10 when he says, God is not unjust and he will not forget your work as you, uh, with the love that you have shown him and as you have helped his people and as you continue to help them. We want you to show the same kind of diligence to the very end so that what you hope for, I love this part, this is my favorite part, so that after you've done all of this, you've helped his people, I see your diligence. What you hope for will become fully realized. It's going to be made manifest. It's going to come to fruition in your life. God cares so much. He may even bless you with something and bless you and restore things in your life that you've forgotten about, things that you've longed for, things that you've stopped praying for. Is this not the good news? As we make our way to communion, consistent with today's message, the central thing to whom John the Baptist prepared the way for was Jesus Christ. And of course, Christ was all about restoration. The desired restoration of our lives to God is found in the term reconciliation. Reconciliation simply means the restoration of friendly relations. So when we think about it, reconciliation is actually a divine process that is also an opportunity that transitions you from a state of being incompatible with God to being compatible with Him. Transitioning you from being an enemy and an opponent to being a friend. 